Belize is a tiny Caribbean country in Central America, which is a favorite holiday resort for people from all over the world. I didn't tell you what's going on, no? Many visitors stay on the small island of San Pedro. Most of them come to dive and explore the coral reef. The trouble is that they're in danger of spoiling it. Could a new type of eco-holiday help? Helen has been sent to find out more. So I have my challenge to make a report on ecotourism, which I interpret that to be being a green tourist and looking after the environment while you're having a good holiday. And I've been given a handy cam. Can I just ask you why you chose to come to San Pedro? Because well, of the environment. Yes, it was my husband's choice. The finest water in the Caribbean. And you dive? Yeah. Oh, so that's why you're attracted. Can I ask you why you chose to come to San Pedro? We're divers. Have you actually tried out the scuba diving already? Yes. Yeah. How is it? It's great. There's a lot of coral and a lot of uh, sea life. Sea life. And what Helen doesn't know is that she'll be helping a group of scientists collect information for the Belizean government underwater. So why are tourists important to the people who live in San Pedro? On the mainland, you wouldn't have a job. Just a few people have jobs in the mainland, so... So for you, tourism has really improved your life? Oh, yes. Yes? What Probably. sort of things do you have now than you didn't have before? Well, I um, have a television. I have... I buy whatever I, I see for my baby. This is a coral island. Moving from the sea toward the island, the first thing is the coral reef. This acts as a barrier, helping protect the island from rough seas, which is why it's called a barrier reef. The reef is also a home for beautiful tropical fish and plants. Just behind the reef, the water is shallower and calm. It acts as a kind of nursery, where young fish and plants can grow without being damaged by the rough sea outside of the reef. Then comes the island itself. This is formed from dead coral. Around the edge of these islands grow mangrove trees. These are healthy mangroves. And believe it or not, this is a healthy mangrove forest. It serves a very useful purpose. In tropical regions like Belize, where storms and hurricanes are quite frequent, Mangroves also provide a physical barrier against them. Um, the way the, the, the root system of the red mangroves are, are formed, um, they actually hold the earth together, and in some instances, they actually help to, to build up the, the land along the, the coastline. Because most people, including tourists, prefer living on the, on the coast, more and more mangroves are being cleared for, for housing and hotel development. The, the clearance of, of mangrove from the coast could also lead to the, to the complete destruction of an, of an entire island. Beaches also play a, a vital role. Dead plant material, for example, seagrasses, are washed up on the beaches by waves. Once on these beaches, these dead plant material are broken down by smaller organisms and are eventually washed back into the ocean. Once in the ocean, these plant material provide food for other living organisms. Hotel development on these beaches remove the, this vital habitat, which provides food for, for these living organisms. As more and more people come to visit the islands, more and more hotels are built, which destroy more and more mangroves and beaches. And more people bring another problem, more rubbish. San Pedro has a rotting problem. This dump is out of control. Paper, plastic, metal, in fact, everything is dumped here together and so gets all mixed up. This is very wasteful. Some of these things could be recycled. 
but also harmful chemicals like battery acid is leaking through the ground into the fresh water, making it undrinkable. The 1994 Winter Olympics were held in the small town of Lillehammer in Norway. From the moment the town was chosen, the government made very strict rules for the designers of the events. They also didn't want their beautiful countryside spoilt. The ski run couldn't be built higher than the surrounding line of trees. To help the designers visualize their buildings, they use computer-aided design systems. A mountain was chosen for the site of the ice rinks, not the outside, but the inside of it. A huge cavern was carved out measuring 61 meters wide, 91 meters long, and 24 meters high. Building the rinks inside the mountain hid them from view and insulated them from the effects of the changing outside temperature so well that the Norwegians saved a huge amount of money on their electricity bill. The system that kept the ice frozen on this bobsleigh run had to be specially designed so that there was absolutely no chance that any chemicals could leak out that were dangerous to the environment. If they did, the design company would have had to pay a big fine. It's taken over two hours to get to the island behind me, where the Coral Key Conservation Group are based. Now, I've been told I've got to find out what science has got to do with tourism. And the person to ask is John Hossevar. Hi. Hi, hello. Hi, I'm Helen Leslie. Nice to meet you. Oh. Welcome to Calabash. Thank you. I've got the right person then. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, what have I got to do here? Well, this operation is run by Coral Key Conservation. Basically, we uh, use volunteers to collect data on all the animals and fish and everything that live in the ocean out here so we can find the best way to protect it, to conserve everything. Um, so, the best way for you to find out about that is you'll be staying here for a couple days. Okay. And, uh, Here's your tent. Uh, let's walk over here and we can find a good spot to put it. <laughs> you mean you don't have a hotel here? <laughs> um, not as such. Oh. Right. Well, let's see what's in here then. I can't remember the last time I put a tent up. It must have been years. <laughs> what do you think? Quite nice colours. I better have another look at the picture. Here, come over here what it's meant to look like at the end of it. Dome-shaped nylon tent valley. Now, this is what I like. Not only does it come equipped with the instructions, but a person to help you as well. <laughs> I suppose try and make it yeah. as taut as possible, and yes? also, dig it into the sand like so. Yep. That angle. Sleeping bag on the ground sheet. Underneath the mosquito net. I'm not going to need the ground sheet. That's rather nice. How about that? Not bad, hey, with a little bit of help. Hello, what's your name? Oh, no, I'm Jeremy. Jeremy? Yes. Jeremy, what are you doing here? All right, I'm waiting just to go into the shower here. That's the shower? Yes, that's the shower. Is this the only form of getting clean on the island? Apart from the sea. Oh. We're not allowed to use the fresh water to wash in because it's um, too precious to use it for drinking. Um, but in the morning, we've got a well here which has got some brackish water in it. Yep. And basically just, just pump it backwards and forwards with a hand pump. So that's water up there. Well, Jeremy, in you get. Yeah, OK, <laughs> I have to. I have to disrobe first. OK, OK, <laughs> I'll so switch the camera off. <laughs> so what's it like living on a desert island? It is half past six on a Sunday morning, and already there seems to be a hive of activity. <laughs> 
This, by the way, is the inside of my tent. You might have remembered it. And uh, I think I ought to go out and find out what's happening. Whew, it's been stifling in here all night. And I think the mosquito net has actually worked because I don't seem to be itching. And I haven't seemed to come up with too many bites. So let's go out and find out what life is like outside. I can really tell it's early morning. Just beautiful. Morning. Morning. Hi. Oh dear. What's happening here? Breakfast. What's that in the oven? Bacon, believe it or not. It's bacon. And what are you frying there? Bacon. Hash browns. It's potato. And then we're going to make scrambled eggs. A good breakfast is essential before a hard day working underwater. A coral reef is the skeleton of millions and millions of tiny animals called polyps. The polyps live in this skeleton and get their food from microscopic plants that live inside them. These plants need sunlight and warmth, so coral reefs are only found in hot, sunny places like the tropics. The volunteers are collecting information for the Belizean government. What they're really trying to do is to find out where the best places are for tourism in this country so that they don't wipe out species that are already rare. So that if we find something that's very common um, and there's a lot of it, they'll think that's a good place to build a hotel, for example. But if we find a very rare species, that whole area will be sealed off and preserved as a marine park or something um, to preserve certain species, really. There's lots of different types of species of coral or whatever. What am I likely to see tomorrow? One of the things you might see tomorrow is called blushing star. That's it here. It's, um, as you can see, it's orangey, reddy colour. It's called blushing star because if you go up to it and touch it or feel it slightly, it will blush white. <laughs> so that's how it got its name. Some it's of them are quite easy, sense. like brain coral, which is all quite exciting. They're very easy to spot because they look like a brain. And it does as well. <laughs> I said there are different varieties, of course. There's a knobby brain, grooved brain, giant brain. Knobby brain looks like you've got a disease. There are millions and millions of different living things on the Earth that we know about, but we think there are a lot more that we haven't found yet. Finding out what they are and where they live is a huge job that will go on for hundreds of years. These are only a few of the things that live on the reef. The volunteers have to learn to identify as many different types of fish, corals and plant that live here as they can, and remember them. Okay, well, once we've learned how to identify all the different things that live out there, then what we do is we take these quadrats, we call them, big squares about one meter on a side. We have the divers go down with their underwater notebooks and they have to record what exactly is in this area of reef. So we're looking mostly at the things that are on the bottom, on the reef itself. So these would be things like the corals, the plants, in the ocean we call the plants algae. So the corals, the plants, sponges, things like that. So it's really concentrating your study to a tiny area. That's right, because we can't survey the whole reef. It's, it's really huge, so we have to look at little bits of it and piece the bits together. Do I actually take one of these with me and put it on the ground? That's right. The divers actually bring them out and put them on the bottom. And then with my waterproof book, I take it out and say, aha, well, I can see such and such down there. That's right.
The divers work in pairs. They check the identification of everything that lives inside the square of the quadrat. All of the information collected underwater is used by the Ministry of Agriculture. This is a picture of the coral reef taken from a satellite thousands of miles up in the sky. This kind of imagery allows us to do things which we can't do just with photographs because it allows us to see through the water. In effect, it's like pulling the plug out. It also lets us add false color to make things begin to be like a map uh, and also to combine this data with others, for example, from coral key conservation. Looking at a closer part of the map, all of the blue lines are places where the divers have collected information about what lives on the reef. What you can see here is a simplified version of the satellite image plus the data from the divers. In brief, what we have is uh, this green area of the seagrass beds, which I showed you earlier, uh, on the quay, the mangroves, and in very great detail, across the reef section, uh, all the various habitats. This particularly comes from the divers. With all of this information, the Ministry can begin to decide how people can use the area. In the blue area, people can dive to look at coral, but not catch fish. In the green area, people are allowed to dive and fish. Whereas only scientific research is allowed in this red area. Key conservation volunteers will be working on the coral reef for a long time to come. Helen's challenge was to help them collect information for the Belizean government. The more information it has, the better job it can make of protecting the environment at the same time as giving people a good holiday. Oh. <laughs> it was absolutely brilliant. I'm quite exhilarated. I've never seen so many fish and different sorts of cod coral and algae and the sponges were very interesting down there as well i'm not sure if i can remember what the different types are but they looked fascinating and the fish were so beautiful some really deep blues some yellows there and they looked amazing.